This is such a great opportunity. I've been wanting to do this, as Harini, Harini knows, for a very long time. So welcome, everyone, to this uh, evening's conversation. Um, essentially, I think it's going to be a chat between two people who just adore the city. <laughs> so um, how many of you have read the book already? Nobody? Just got it. OK, OK. Uh, I should say you guys are in for a treat. Um, I really, really enjoyed how, uh, I think like for all Bangaloreans, you no know, reading a book set in the city, uh, you know, every time she mentions Basavangudi, there's this little frisson of excitement. Then there's like Kaban Park, oh, I know this. And then there's Maleshwaram and all these lovely, lovely places which, you know, feature in your book. I love how you've woven practically the entire city into it. And uh, that was really, really well done. So congratulations. Um, just uh, tell me a little bit about how this book came about. Uh, yeah, it's on. OK, so uh, how the book came about is uh, in about in 2006. So I'm an ecologist, as uh, the introduction said, and I've I had been working mostly in forests from 92, 93 when I started working on ecology. and But I'm from Bangalore. And uh, as Mira and I bond a lot about the love for Bangalore, this is my favorite city. Lived in many places, always come back here, can't imagine living anywhere else. Uh, so in 2006, that's when, you know, the lakes were getting filled in, the uh, roads, the trees were being cut on the roads. I started looking at ecology of the city and then started doing some work on the trees, you know, how many trees are there on the roads, how many, wh what's the condition of the lakes and started with that. And uh, then realized that when we started talking to people uh, that uh, those who love the nature in the city, it's an obvious thing. But there are many who, who you need a hook to pull them into, you know, so, so the, otherwise you land up preaching to the choir. So history was that hook because everyone's interested in history and the past. And so we started with that and then I started looking at maps and I, one of the earliest conversations I had with Meera was where do you get archival material? And then of course, you know, it was an entire journey getting into the archives, getting all old maps, uh, gazetteers, uh, newspaper accounts. So I think it was 2007, my mother's house, which is in JP Nagar, lovely old part of the city with a rain tree outside. And I was looking at this entire set of material. And uh, suddenly the main character, who's Kaveri, young feisty woman, popped into my head. And it's almost, so that was the book, the start of the book, Kaveri, you know, the one you see here. So... Yeah, she popped into my head. All I knew about her was she was young and she was from a previous era and extraordinarily determined and very different. And it almost like she sort of told me to write about her. I didn't know what I was going to write about her. And a, a detective mystery was a natural for someone like me who grew up on Agatha Christie's and the Golden Age mysteries and all of that. So, so that was a plan. I think when Mira, you and I met first, I told you I'm writing a book. But it took from 2007 to now, you know, to actually get it done. Um, yeah. It's not very easy. I mean, I've been told my, by many people who work in fiction that a detective novel is, in fact, like the most difficult because you have to lay out the clues very well without giving the story away and just give them this much so that they keep uh, they stay hooked. So, how did you? I mean, that's interesting that you chose this particular genre in which to write about. I think I chose it without realizing how difficult it was and then I learned. So I've written fiction before. I mean, in fact, I wrote fiction well before I started writing non-fiction. And uh, I used to, I've written since I was a kid. Uh, and then I wrote short stories for children in these Sunday newspapers and then uh, some literary short fiction also, which got published in literary magazines. That's very easy because my style of writing is I dive in and it's characters and they take me where it, they go and the story ends where it ends. I don't know where it's going to end. It's sort of, I, I start writing and it figures itself out. Obviously, a detective novel is very different. And I can't, I tried so many times to sit and plot this out. It just doesn't work for me. So the reason it took so long was I had to figure out my method. And the method I figured out was essentially I rewrote the book three times, the plot three times. Okay, so there were things that went halfway through and got stuck, then 75% through and got stuck, and then I went almost to the end. In fact, the, the book that uh, that Little Brown, the, my publishers in the UK took, was also different, because after they took it, they gave me excellent ideas, and then I reworked the plot again. 
okay and so this 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 is the fourth version of the book book 2 i didn't have that luxury and uh, book 2 i had to get done in 2 months i was already very behind on my deadline because of number of personal emergencies and i'm supposed to do a book every year so what i did for book 2 was a completely different method uh, i wrote the book out in 20 pages so to speak i again launched them off launched kaveri off on page 1 with no idea where she would go but i wrote 20 pages you know compressed version in a go and then Send that to my editors and my agent, and then we workshopped it a bit, and, and then so that was much easier. I said, okay, this probably satisfies both aspects of me that I, I I can't plot, and on the other hand, I don't have the time to keep you know another fourteen years for book two is not going to work. <laughs> okay, so when is the second book coming out? Two thousand twenty. Yeah, next year March. Wow. Okay. Yeah. uh more bangalore love <laughs> so, more bangalore love yes <laughs> okay so let's talk about uh, the main character kaveri a little bit she as you said is quite a feisty young woman and um, remarkably modern in her ideas uh, quite a feminist if i may say so and um, she's not the only one one of the things i liked about your book like there are so many of these lines scattered throughout which i said oh i love this i love this i should write it down so um i think it is one of the characters umanti who says once um men are important but not as much as they think they are like, yeah <laughs> yes and then uh, there was another line which i think um kaveri thinks about she says women's dreams were only as big as their husbands egos would permit them to be so um, these are like very interesting takes so how did this how did kaveri turn out to be like the so i think that part to me <laughs> we tend to think that the women in the olden eras were oppressed and they yes of course they were but i think all of us can remember a grandmother or a great aunt who was extraordinarily uh, dominant the power behind the you know in the power of the house who ran the entire neighborhood you know things like that who bucked the trend and i have always been very fascinated by those kinds of women so a lot of this came from conversations with my mother and i'll give you some examples huh, of so my husband's aunt who's 96 in chennai kaveri start, the scene opens with kaveri swimming in a sari now she went swimming in a sari she would she used ho- rode horses she played tennis and she went swimming in a sari in the madras club in the 1930s what else should would she wear if not a sari because that's what she's always worn but she did all of these things my mother's grandmother was an ayurvedic vaidya which she learned from her father and her husband was uh, working for the british the british jail superintendent was a reformer and did a lot of funny you know funky things with prison reform but wanted his wife to be a certain way it's, she had to wear blouses you know those that's the era when the women started wearing blouses she had to learn how to eat with cutlery speak to the english learn knitting crochet but what she would tell my mother is when they were in madurai or uti in the middle of the night midnight there would be a knock on the door there would be a strange man with a cart and he would say come my wife is having a baby she needs help and she would go and there nobody could stop her because it was god's work So she'd set off with a strange man somewhere in midnight, deliver a baby. You know, no, obviously, no light on the road, etc. You don't know who this person is. Go, deliver a baby, dig a hole in the uh, ground, bury the afterbirth, come back, have a ritual bath, purify herself, and start cooking for the family. So I think they. So this whole thing of women's egos. So you know, you women managed. They moved through the crevices, managing. But I think. there were a lot of powerful women who weren't held back and i was always very curious to know how did they manage mm-hmm. you know so okay um i'm also curious will you be giving a little bit more back story to kaveri because in this book we see her kind of fully formed mm-hmm. the way she is um uh, but you also say that she's from a conservative family so it would be really nice to know how did she turn out like this i mean i know you've just talked about all this but then it still would be nice to know a little bit more about oh, what prompted her to become the way she is i hope to be able to expl- explore all of these you know i so it's right now a three book series that the publishers have taken so i will have those three hmm. but uh, i'm hoping i'm already you know talking to them about doing a second three book series so if i can get 6 9 12 books whatever you know depending on how how they go and how 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 long there is interesting material to write about then i hope i can ex- explore all of this so the next book is a lot about kaveri's relationship with her mother in law because mm-hmm. as you know if since you've not read the book i don't want to give you spoilers but she has a very difficult relationship with her mother in law because her mother in law is much more traditional and conventional and says like she, uh, too much studying makes a woman's brains go soft 
and so you know but on the other hand when you get married in india you don't just marry your husband especially in those days you married your your in-laws and you had to get along with them one way or the other so do they get along do they make things worse that entire relationship is there sorry the backdrop but i do want to take in one of the future stories kaveri back to her home in mysore and um, hopefully something happens there because i want to explore mysore as a city but also get into the back story of kaveri's own family okay okay so um what was your i know you are a researcher but what was your research process like for this book because you've you've uh, the so much of the city that we get to see um so what was it like to build that atmosphere yeah. to build the the city as it was which is obviously not like it is now how was that how did you do it that was harder because you have to use so much imagination i mean in terms of the structures you know of course this building was there it's in the map or there was a photograph and people looked like this is the clothes they wore it wasn't easy by any means but it was possible but there were other things what did they cook with you know what was the floor like or uh, yeah what were the uh, how did they boil their milk all kinds of little things like that that i had to study and how did they think was a big challenge again speaking to my mother and aunts about their ancestors i think i got some sense of how some of the women and men thought in that era and similarly you know so, so some of that i brought in but that would be upper class homes that would not be homes like let's say mala or the cowherds homes so for that again we have because we do a lot of ecological research we've done oral histories of various people around for instance sampangi lake and people talking about how their grandfathers and grandmothers used to live 100 years ago so we used bits and pieces i used bits and pieces of that and 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 wove them in and then newspapers newspapers were very useful for some of these odd stories of what happened in fact in book 2 there are many more of these because it's like got more comfortable with using the archives and occasionally there are these really nice um, stories of women written by the by their grandchildren or written by themselves so i don't know how many of you've heard uh, this um, i've read these things it's called women writing in india by uh, suzi tharu and uh, yeah so lovely books this collection of women's writing in their own voices and one of them is this story about this bengali woman uh, i don't know if you remember it which had a huge influence on me about a woman who was married when she was 12 into a traditional orthodox bengali brahmin family and so though she was in a wealthy house she did all the cooking herself and she had this large family and uh, they she describes a period of 3 days where she cooked for everyone and fed everyone but she for where some guests came children spoiled the food and nobody noticed in her house for 3 days that she hadn't eaten the food yeah? and she always wanted to read and write and her family laughs at her and eventually she teaches herself from her grandchildren's books she thinks her son will teach her he also laughs at her and there's no help you know from her husband obviously and so she teaches herself to read and write in secret and writes these diaries and many years later after her death they discover this and publish it so in some sense she was my inspiration for uma aunty and then there's a lovely book called amba which uh, somebody wrote about a woman from bangalore whose husband passed away uh, this lady called amba devi uh, amba bai uh, her husband passed away when she was 21 or 20 or something and she had three children and then her father got her educated she became a headmistress later and then her granddaughter's written this book about her you know so bits and pieces bits and pieces to try and recreate life but i wish we had more of these indian accounts most of the accounts as you know are all in british voices and it's very difficult to imagine indian accounts except from these few things like this yeah it's um you did mention this but then um a lot of the book does seem to be from the upper class perspective i assume that's also because of the sources that were available to you you did mention that you've used oral it is all partly the sources but partly it was the story also so you know a story has to go in one direction and this story right. went in this direction so there might be other stories that go in a different direction you know <laughs> in the sense so i think that's the difference when you also asked about the detective novel if i had written this as historical fiction i would have probably been able to balance it better or might have felt the need to balance it here the story was paramount and the story went in in one perspective which is this you know there so we'll see with future stories okay um you mentioned also um how a lot of these interesting tidbits are actually sourced from say newspapers and things so um uh, coming across those tidbits it's a bit like easter eggs you know suddenly this little one little factoid which is um, for example you've mentioned how in lalbagh 
I can say this, it's not really impacting the plot. Um, you've mentioned how in Lalbagh there was this uh, dog which was feeding tigers, right? Which is true, as I shared that photo with you, which is true. So um, how did you decide? I mean, there must be so many interesting tidbits like this. So I think one of the things that any author faces is how much to include and how much to leave out. How did you decide that? Yeah. So, I, and that feeds in very well with your previous question. So, my initial versions of the plot, again, the book that they took, my editors took, had much more ecology, much more description of various other parts of the city that I took out, including parts of the city that, you know, like you're saying, it was not just the upper class, but there were different areas, fishermen's quarters, for instance, and other tidbits, and more food. And so, I just got long things saying, you know, this is three pages. I'm not sure other people not from Bangalore would be so interested. Can you cut it out? So they, as they, when you write, we are often told that when you have to edit, you have to kill your darlings. So I had to actually kill my darlings and take a lot large chunks out of this before, the, the, in that version. In the second book I started reading, so I've been listening to, so uh, what has been very useful for me is two groups. One is the Sisters in Crime and one is Mister Mystery Writers of America, both online, I mean, both groups, largely US focused, but they have a, you know, a membership from across the world. And they, I'm a member of both, and they have podcasts where it's not writing classes, which I've not found very helpful, frankly, but it's writers discussing their own processes. And one of the things that historical writers say, found I found very useful that if you want to write about something, put in maybe three facts or these factoids. Use that as a sort of rule of thumb. And if you do that, people get into the setting. But sprinkle them, not all three in the same paragraph. So I'm using that now as rule of thumb to say, okay, when you say kill your darlings, you know, how much is too much and uh, how do I do this? So have a better balance, I'll say. I also find this funny because now ecologist friends of mine, I don't know what you feel, say, oh, we know an ecologist has written it because it's a great deal of ecology. But to me, it's not an ecological book because I took out at least 20 or 30 pages with so much more information that I felt was very fascinating. But they didn't think anyone wanted to hear. Yeah, you can tell it's an ecologist book if you're an ecologist yourself. I agree with that because the bits where you do talk about uh, some, there are a few paragraphs here and there where you talk about ecology and there it's very obvious, you know, your love and your knowledge about it, it really comes through. So, yeah, I would agree with your friends. Speaking of these factoids, so you're writing um, historical fiction come detective, um, but I did notice there are some historical inaccuracies, right? So, for example, I think you've mentioned in passing um, Gandhiji came in 1921, whereas he came in 1920. And then you've mentioned Wilson Garden, which wasn't there in the 1920s. It was there only much later. So how do you balance, uh, since you've chosen the genre, how do you balance the needs of the story or your creative process as against the need for historical accuracy, given that you are writing a his, you know, historical fiction? I think that's a really core question. So, and I'm sure that's a balance I'll work out better as I go along. For instance, somewhere in the copy, you know, the, the changing of the editing process and revising process, and you'll see this, uh, I'm sure you've noticed, um, Madras, which was called Madras, then became Chennai. And so I realized it as soon as the book was printed, and then now a couple of reviews pointed it out. So one of the things is future versions will remove that and go back. Gandhi, I, Gandhiji actually changed deliberately, and I was going to put a note, but the note somehow got slipped out in, in multiple drafts. And the idea was because in one of the previous versions of the plot, this played a major role. And so now it doesn't. So I should have changed it back to actually 1921 when he came, which would actually fit with a future book that I'm planning to do. But it's one of those oops things, you know. So and uh, yeah, I should have. And uh, so now what I'm doing with this version is, you know, I'm taking historical liberties, but I'm putting that in my note to uh, from the, a note from the author saying, look, I've done this, but this was the historical fact. And there is a, you know, I've taken historical liberties. Because again, it's I think one thing you get better at as you write, that you need certain things to change for a plot. Like my second one is murder under a red uh, moon. And a red moon is of course, bl uh, blood red moons happen when the lunar eclipse happens. And there was a lunar eclipse around the time, but it wasn't in the month that I wanted it to be. So I have said that, look, I'm taking this liberty. Or oh, there's another festival of a particular god, which is not in the month that I've set it, but I want it to be there. So I've moved it. You know, so. So, yeah, you will be including a note to I, say I, this. I, I, I think did, that's a good idea. So I have idea. a historical note here, but I should have added all of those pieces. Again, it's it's the edit. It's understanding the process because originally what I felt was it seemed to make the note too heavy to add all of this, and then it became okay. 
how scholarly do you want this to be it's a you know fiction book and so we did a bit of back and forth and i was thinking let me keep this light you know okay. pe people won't be really interested in all of this they focusing on the mystery and then i realized no people there will be one group of people who want to know the accuracy or if it's if you've yeah. deliberately moved it yeah. want to know why i think that's a good idea for example in uh, in this book not 11 stops for to the present which is historical fiction for kids uh, this is what we did so it's like 11 stories and all of them are historical fiction set in different times of um, the past and all in bangalore after every story we've given a, a note you know so that people get a context for what it is and get an idea of how much of this yeah. is imagination and how much of it is actually yeah. uh, true but there's also a challenge of trying to for instance because this book is sold in the us and europe and and the uk and india is a huge balancing act which i've still not, i mean i don't know if i'll ever figure it out but i find that the indian audience reading it wants a lot more detail the uk and the us audience feels like there's already enough detail maybe a little too much detail you know because they are com coming so new to the setting everything is new for them mm. so this is a constant balancing act that i think i have to get figure out what to do because sometimes too much of this i do get this push back and i think rightly so from my editor saying look it's too much people mm. are not going to be interested in this they want a book that the book should do it subtly without all of this right. so on the other hand if you know someone from bangalore will be wondering why have i giving them the basic facts that they already know so well <laughs> <laughs> okay so it okay. it is it's not uh, it's okay. something i have to f i guess i'll get better at it as i go on. so um there are two things again that uh, uh i found quite interesting one is the fact that you've in included these recipes at the end was that for the foreign audience largely both both i did want to have traditional recipes so the bisi bela for instance is there but that's in a hot pot which is the not to the foreign audience but uh, yeah no i did want to have recipes because for me i'm very interested one of the historical aspects i'm very very interested in is old traditional recipes that have faded away i would probably have put slightly different recipes so i'm slowly i'm, I'm i've done a mix as you can see here mm. some things like majjige which which an indian audience would know but some things like bisi bela which people maybe don't cook at home anymore right so so there there is that mix but there will be books uh, there will be cooking and you know feasts yeah. and future food well. and, and all of this <laughs> okay so i just to tell you i mean again it's it's a question of writing for multiple audiences one of the things the editors told me was there's a little too much tree love and food love going on in the in the book so this is what you see is like a third of what there was and there was much more so i'm i'm hoping to put the the stuff i took out in future books nice okay uh, the other thing i noticed is uh, there's also a lot of detail about the sarees yeah yeah she's wearing this this ochre with gold thread blah 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 like every time you describe this which is i think again an interesting thing so what prompted that that i did want to have that and the jewelry because i think to me that really brings alive the time so again it's something that i've been interested in there's not as much information on the south indian sarees but some of this again is like you know grandmother saree or my mother's descriptions of what colors there were which were popular you know 80 100 years ago so elephant gray was a very big thing or the ms blue but ms blue was much later of course than this so but i might have an ms kaveri wear an ms blue at some point and write in my historical note that i moved moved it here but yeah that was something i wanted because i think what i love about period fiction is often that whole especially the 1920s you know you had this very nice mix of british and indian influences so the puffed blouses the velvet the organza the chiffons and that that kind of style of wearing blouses with the brooch pick uh, pin here but then with the indian saree so mm. i i'm very interested in that and i wanted to bring some of that in here why did you pick the 1920s so originally i had the 1890s in in my very first version in my second version of the plot the first version was a different one but the second version of the plot ronald ross who is the nobel prize winner who discovered that um, malaria came from mosquitoes was in charge of health in bangalore in 1892 1890 1891 and uh, that was that was a time there was a uh, cholera going around in bangalore and he sanitized the city and so i had the, and there was vaccination also going on so i had this because of the you know the ecology in mind and i had all these fascinating documents about the city the first one was a very very involved plot which was talking about vaccination and cholera and a murder being snuck into all of this 
and then i changed that because as uh, priya priya dev swami my agent we had a conversation and she said look there's this backdrop with cholera and then there was a plague before that and one third of the cities either dead or been shunted out to camps and then you have this one murder going on and it's a little incongruous because you're trying to solve one murder when you know large swathes of the city are collapsing and also it's not light because i'm clearly writing a light hearted mystery i'm not I, i don't write these very heavy sort of either thrillers or dark mysteries i don't i'm not doing that kind of thing so obviously the dark backdrop was was not working and then i changed it and once i decided i didn't need ross then i didn't need 1891 and then the 1920s became very nice because in terms of so much going on uh, you know women suffrage issues which will come up much more in book 2 because women are asking for the right to vote in the us and in U- the uk but also in sri lanka and india and there are conversations going on and then there is you know women are stepping out of the house so much across the world and then uh, her husband ramo could have gone to the uk and learnt and come back and so there's you know so she can read the vogue for instance and learn about fashion because magazine was there so there's a lot that you can bring in the richness of fabric and the information available about the city so all I, of that made me change it i think it's also an interesting period uh, because like this is the time when uh, the international movement is also, also becoming works. stronger and so there's this is the interwar period there's depression the interwar depression but at the same time there's also a boom in construction in in uh, this part of the world so there's a lot a going lot on which going can on. Yeah. form probably a very interesting backdrop so looking forward to that more okay um hang on there were a couple of other things i want yeah tell me a little bit about your writing process i mean you are a professor of ecology you're also writing these how do you manage how do you juggle when do you write uh, it's it's a task i if i haven't figured out a balance but i'll tell you what i did for book 2 which is hopefully the routine i'll follow for book 3 book 1 i had all the time because i was doing it at you know at my own pace but uh, what i do for this is fortunately i write fast so i in, in a i just need a couple of hours and i get about 1500 to 2000 words done so that you know so basically seven and a half weeks and i had the first draft of book 2 so what i did was very simple uh 3 days a week 6 to 8 i would write that's you know during the weekdays and then get into the work day and then weekends was easier it's 2 3 hours so i would get my you know find my 2 3 hours so as long as i did that i was fine anything more if i try to write every day i get saturated but i could manage this it was very it was an extraordinarily intense 8 weeks and i have to say my family was very patient with it because i have an elderly mom a teenage daughter and they like to see me as you know occasionally so <laughs> so it was i mean, it's it's not easy to sustain year round but uh, but for 2 months it's okay Uh, yeah i have to say i'm a bit jealous huh? i take i take like a week to write 1000 words <laughs> but that's that's also, that's also cuz like there's a lot of uh, research that goes into yeah. each and every thing that you write in that um okay so tell me a little bit about fingerprints this forms like a major part of the story and uh, clearly you've done a lot of reading up on this and you wanted this to come through i find that really fascinating because i didn't really know that uh in india in bangalore we were actually using uh, finger- fingerprints as early as the 1920s or even earlier mm-hmm. so yeah so tell me a bit about that so the science of fingerprinting was developed in india and uh, then you know by claimed by a british person but actually in calcutta but actually the people who who worked for him who were indians did all the art of classifying these by developing the entire classification system grouping them extraordinary work and of course he took the i don't know if he, it's it's not very clear whether he took the popular credit because he does attribute the people who work with him in credit for them but anyway in popular imagination it has become that the british discovered fingerprinting in india and this is actually the legacy of transferring the book from the 1890s because some of the things that i talk about as recent science in the 1920s actually were already there from the 1890s onwards so i just left it as again this is writers liberties because i made it sound very modern in the 1920s but it was actually ancient science by then it was very widely used and uh, yeah there is um, fingerprinting is used fairly substantially in the story to try and get clues and kaveri being a young woman who's interested in science has learned about this from uh, her school uh, from uh, from her schooling and then reads up on it by going to the sheshadri pura memorial library and taking a book from the library which also lets me get into the history of that li- lovely public library a little bit but it's it's interesting how much science there was like the whole survey of india mapping which was my plot one actually 
<laughs> yeah, the plot too was the cholera. I wanted, hopefully I'll bring them in in future books. But there was so much science that was developed in India at that time. You know? The entire, the native surveyors who are really talked about was so fundamental to the creation of this whole geographic mapping system that we call the Survey of India. And there's again so much in there that one could bring into plots. So um, I should add here that when she's talking about surveys, uh, I assume you know about the Great Trigonometrical Survey, right? Um, some of you may be aware of this, the Great Trigonometrical Survey, the GTS as it's called, which actually began in Bangalore. Um, in 1800. So there was a pilot done in Bangalore in 1800 and then it eventually started in 1802 but we still have rel um, relics of the survey around the city. So there's like a, there's an observatory in Kannur near um, up north and then uh, there's another, there used to be an observatory in the Ramana Maharishi Park which was destroyed some, which was uh, replaced by a little monument some many many years ago and there are all these benchmarks which are there like all around the city in many of the churches for example um, at, the, at the base of some statues, at the base of some water troughs. So there's like all these little bits of history everywhere if you just know where to find them. Um, Oh gosh, my next question just slipped out of my mind. Um, I was wondering about, um, there's, there's not a lot that I get in the book about the division in the city, right? So the cantonment or the civil and military station as it's called by now and the old part of the city. You do allude to it, but not a whole lot. Are we going to see more of this or was this like a, because this seems like a, a rather strong feature of the city, you know? Anybody living there would have um, felt that divide. They would, uh, and yet, uh, I guess this was not part of this story, and it's probably not going to be part of the next. It depends on whom I'm going to get. If I got somebody who is, uh, so Uma Auntie, for instance, would be somebody that could explore that part of the divide. Someone like Kaveri, whose husband was already working for the British, I think may not, it might not have been such an apparent divide because they were anyway mingling. So there are, I guess it's, yeah, a lot of this will be story-led in terms of what I can actually showcase about the city. It needs to fit into the story naturally. Okay. Um, there's another aspect to this, um, which I found interesting. You talk about um, this very obvious uh, anti-British feeling that uh, many of the characters in your story display, like whether it is the gardeners or... Um, Ramu himself, to a certain extent, the main one of the the main male character, uh, Kaveri, of course. So, um, how true do you think that is? That's a hard one. So, my again, it's it's the documents that we have left behind are the British or the Indians who worked with the British, and therefore, and because you have the Mysore Maharaja, it's a princely state, and he's buffering this whole thing, and he's obviously very pro-British, but also the Indians here are not facing the kinds of, um, well, not to say that it's not oppressive, but it's not as oppressive as it would be in Calcutta or Bombay, right? It's, mm. it's very, it's, it's a lighter touch of the British uh, governance system. So definitely there was not as much. You know, for instance, right. King, um, uh, sorry, Prince Ed, uh, Edward, when he came, this is 1921, and he came in November to Bombay, and he's on his visit, and they're throwing stones at him. And uh, when he comes to Bangalore, the description in the newspapers are completely hagiographic. People turned out on the streets to cheer the Prince of Wales and there were bands yeah. playing. There was a move to boycott, there was but also it was not exactly. very successful. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is deliberately pull in some of those. And yeah. you'll see more so, of it in book two. You know, Sarojini Naidu was here and uh, she came right. and she was also addressing partly a protest meeting, if you read through, you know, between the lines of the newspaper. So I'm reading between the lines and, and talking about it. It's okay. If I had picked the 1930s in Bangalore, I could have, I would have had a much more prominent role right, of independence right. and maybe I'll get there if I get a long enough time with the book. Okay, yeah, that was, that was something I was uh, wondering about because it does seem like it was not as, um, the movement was really not as wasn't, strong wasn't as, and as widespread strong. Yeah, and no. mass-based no. here it, as it was in other places. Already by the, yeah. by now, by the 1920s in Calcutta yes. and uh, Bombay, definitely. Yes, yes, yes yeah. Okay. I mean, Jallianwala Bagh happened, so you know there was there was all of that in the background, and that the repercussions were all through India, I think. So, but mm. mm -hmm. okay. there was some, you know. So when Gandhi came, for instance, uh, there was I think there's a time 
just maybe a couple of years after that when Mirza Ismail wants to invite him again and there's this entire correspondence with the British where he's actually being told don't invite him and yeah. it's not a very wise thing for you to be wanting to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's also this time, I think that's a bit later though, when uh, he is invited as a guest of the state and I think later on even Nehru, he hoists the flag and... Uh, as a guest of Mizra, uh, Mirza Ismail, and then the very next day, there's all this communication between Mirza and the British fellow saying, how could you allow this? This is not done. You know? It's not done, yeah. yeah so yeah. They, they had to lo like also walk a very walk fine line. Fine yeah. line, yeah, between, you know. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. Are we going to see more of this later? I hope so, yes, yes. So as the books progress and I get into future times, and I will be changing the timeline a little bit for Writer's Liberty to, to get some of this. Uh -huh. You know, for instance, there's this very interesting thing, which is closer to independence and then post-independence, where Mirza Ismail is, is writing to some other people, and I think it's Hyderabad, where there are women who are given positions in the government. And he has this very interesting correspondence where he actually says, how could they do this? Women aren't capable of things like this. You know, they all it's all very well, but they have their place and this is not their place. So I want to see if I can bring in touches of all of this. But of course, Mirza Ismail is not yet prominent here. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. Vishweshwaraya's time. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of women again, um, the, the principal of the school that both of us attended way back in the early 1900s, I think it was in the first decade or second decade of the 1900s, there was this lady called Edith Gao. I should share with you what she had written um, because um, this is Bishop Cotton School that I'm talking about. So both of us went to that school. And um, there was this time when I think the Bishop Cotton Boys School, uh, the administra administration was largely based there in the boys school. And there was some move to cut down the salaries and say women only do embroidery. She wrote back this amazing letter saying that, you know, you guys really need to move with the times. Women are this, women are that, blah, blah, blah. So um, when I was reading about some of the things that Kaveri says, I kept thinking about this Edith Gao's letter. I'll share that with you. Maybe you can incorporate it somewhere sometime. It'd be quite nice. That would be great. You know, I was thinking about this lovely paper that I came across and uh, which was talking about women's education in that time in uh, Mysore presidency. And the Maharani was such a strong proponent of women's education. So here she was, there was the Ma Maharani Girls School which is set up in Mysore. The Maharani College for Women which is set up in Mysore. Now my mother says many times to me and I can't find a documentation of this anywhere but the Ma Mysore Maharaja so I'll be interested if you've picked this up. So what they were trying to do is encourage more girls to get educated. And so if you had a girl in your house who was studying, further studying, the Mysore, they would not only just give you a grant to cover her the cost of her education, but give you the house some money because you were paying the cost of feeding her and clothing her and you know all of these other things for some years. So they would act so many houses, she says that's why education picked up so much in Mysore state. And my mother, we are Kanadigas, but she came from Salem, which is a different, you know, Madras presidency. But she says many people used to talk about this saying it would have been so much nicer if we were in Mysore presidency. My parents would have a financial incentive for this, right? So the Maharani wanted to set up a college, similar college for science in uh, for women in Bangalore and link that to Central College program. And the Directorate of Education stymied her efforts. This is their own <laughs> directorate, mm. you know. Yes. But it stymied their efforts for so long by all kinds of reasons. First they said, oh, you can't do science unless you've done maths and English. But women weren't allowed to do maths and English till the, till the 11th. Then they said, okay, you can do it, but where's the demand? Because you already have one program in uh, Mysore. First, show us the demand there. And no Bangaloreans were willing to send their girls to hostel in Mysore to study. You know, obviously, there were the traditions of the times. So one way or the other, by the time it came up, it was seven, eight years later. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just thinking if the Maharani herself doesn't have the power, who has the power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That is an interesting episode, yeah. Um, there was another... Um, I felt that... Do you do talk about caste? In fact, it does play uh, a fairly big role in your story. Um, there were times when I felt it was also being um, not glossed over, but not really uh, mentioned too much. And I understand, it, like you said, it's a light-hearted story. But for example, you uh, the Someshwara Temple in Alsur figures in your story quite often. But um, nowhere do readers get the um, 
get to know that actually many of the people wouldn't even have been allowed inside that temple. It wasn't until much later that uh, everybody was allowed inside. So um, again, was that like a conscious decision or did it just not fit in the story? Or There was too much, especially if I was writing a new series, to put all this information out there, which I did have in my first drafts. It was overwhelming the story. And so that's the balance between writing historical fiction and writing a mystery and so it was becoming you know the mystery was becoming it, it, it was it was like an information overload right right and so then i decided that whatever fits naturally i will keep and the rest i will take out and so i yeah. hope again in future bits to play at it but it has to be natural to the stories what i realize otherwise it just becomes like big info dumps right and then you know for three pages you're learn, reading all about this and you've lost i mean as a regular reader who wants to pick up a mystery they've lost interest in their clothes mm-hmm. Mm. So that's the challenge. So how has the story been received India and elsewhere? How how is the reception been? So I've been thrilled because it's much more than I I I don't think I imagined anything but I definitely didn't imagine the that the New York Times will feature it in their uh, thing of you know best books to read for the week. So that really helped. Apparent so this is something I've been learning. In the US there are these four magazines there's Kirkus Reviews, New York Times, Publishers Weekly and the Library Weekly. And Kirkus Reviews didn't review it but the others all three gave them what they call starred reviews. And that really kick started because it's apparently very unusual to have a book take three out of four of these these big things as star reviews which means all the libraries in the US and Canada have copies not just one copy but sometimes five or six copies so that's been you know someone who loves public libraries that's to me I'm already very happy mm-hmm. uh, the audio book I'm very surprised that so many people listen to audio books because I I don't have the patience an audio book will take me nine hours and I want to know what's happening so I I listen to other podcasts but I can't do a book on audio but audio book has been selling very well uh-huh. the Kindle has been selling very well i mean so i am already more than 15000 copies in uk us and india together india again i was told that fiction won't so if you talk to i was talking to krishna of bookworm uh, last week and he was saying that when he started selling books it was maybe 70% fiction and 30% non fiction and now it's switched mm-hmm. and so the original print run was supposed to be 2000 copies but now we're already close to 5000 so mm-hmm. again I I didn't expect this kind of reception I'm very happy with it and uh, so far very good <laughs> so fingers crossed uh, harini that's that's really nice to hear um why did you have that other cover this is such a lovely cover why did you have to have that for the us like that totally it, have you seen the us cover it's got this woman inside an uh, arched gateway yeah. or something very dramatic so and, this is one right? of the things you learn as you go through the publishing journey it's been very interesting uh we so i don't get i don't, don't get shown i don't have a say i i saw the cover after it was out okay. so one of the things we we could do with the cover was interesting because they had her with the ghungat with her you know hair over her head so priyana had to explain to them that in south india women will not wear that pallu over your head except in certain circumstances but obviously they're more used to the north indian context mm. and so we did ask for the backdrop to be changed etc but it was too late so i don't get cover says but i have having said that i love this i absolutely love the second cover and they've been smart because they know what sells in the us so, so many people we are getting feedback now that they picked up the book because of the cover <laughs> okay so they know their market clearly far better than okay but it was not yeah uh, it was not something that clearly uh, wa- Uh, the the us taste in uh, covers and the uk taste is covers is completely different and i'm uh-huh. seeing the split priya says it's the case with the, the other books she also sells that the markets are very different and what people expect from the markets are very different okay interesting um how about we open up for questions if any yeah i should have brought the us cover <laughs> but i love the second cover is just fabulous i haven't really? i haven't yet that. got the cover of the the british uh, which will be the indian cover for this oh, okay yeah. okay but the indian cover is the best i have to tell you because in the uk little brown created this cover but they couldn't afford to print it with this inset in the gilt because it was too expensive it was pushing it up to another 3 4 pounds uh-huh. and so they finally after designing it in this gorgeous gorgeous way had to do just yellow print and flat and so the indian because we have the publishing advantage has turned out to be the best books the <laughs> of the whole lot so we're getting very nice books in india which is how i would have liked it to be anyway so questions thank you for the lovely uh, conversation um could you um, talk a little bit more about the mystery i'm still curious what that is about 
probably without giving away the spoilers. Um, and honestly, I feel a little let down, sad that you have, you had to let go of all the wonderful prose that you wrote about, um, you know, the ecological and the historical aspects. Um, was that in the interest of supporting the mystery that you were developing through the plot? And was that like an editor-led process rather than coming from your own interests? Thank you. So, uh, the mystery itself, it starts with, um, then this is there in the, in the back, so I'm now not giving any, away any spoilers. Kaveri and her husband go to a dinner at Century Club, very posh surroundings, mixed British Indian society. And then they hear screams running out, uh, ringing out at the middle of their dinner. And uh, then there's a murder. And uh, so she stumbles upon it and she's curious and she starts investigating. But when a vulnerable woman whom she's close to gets accused of the murder and suspected, so the one thing she has is a very strong sense of justice. And she can't see injustice being done. And she's 19 and fearless as we all are at 19. So she thinks she's invincible. She thinks she can be a detective. She thinks she can do anything when she puts her mind to it. And luck favors her. So she, she just starts without... I think, you know, as we would question ourselves much more, she doesn't. She just leads with her mind. And so she, so she goes in there and she decides to solve this mystery. And then the rest is, is how she proceeds through various false starts and using various approaches to de deduction and then and using gossip and women's networks also so what i want so if you look at the way people write uh, fiction for instance is often talked about as what they call the classic hero's journey and if you read um, I many things game of thrones or um, uh, the lord of the rings it's a classic hero story right one hero and the hero could be a woman but it's you know it's a hero story i want to write uh, what they call the heroine stories, which is also a concept in feminist literature, which is where collectives come together. I'm more Harry Potter-like, you know, it's, it's the three of them and the whole group that, that reads. So, so these are all going to be heroine stories with the motley crew of the Bangalore Detective Club that grows. So, so it's how not just Kaveri solves the mystery as her alone with her intelligence, but all of these little these people, her gossipy next door neighbor, Uma Auntie helps her. There's another woman she gets to know who is from a different, completely different um, uh, part of society. So she helps her, you know, this, this entire collective, a, a policeman, uh, her husband, so all of these things. And uh, your second question about it was very much an editorial-led process. So I had, you know, for instance, Kaveri, there's a part in the book where uh, her husband drives her through Century Club and he's telling her about the history of the city because she's moved to the city. And it's right now two and a half pages. Having written now and with some distance, I go back and I already feel there's a lot in there. But I originally had about 10 pages. You know, these are the buildings, these are the places, these are the little nuggets of information and, uh, you know, things like that. So, it's interesting because I was looking at review, you know, uh, so a re review written from different perspectives. Uh, one of the things I talk about is Century Club. And I thought everybody knows that Vishweshwara created Century Club. So, I didn't talk about that a lot. I talked about why it is called Century Club, why it was created. And I took out Vishweshwara. But I recently read a review from someone from Bangalore who said, why didn't she mention this basic fact that Vishweshwara created the club? And you know, again, because of heaviness, because it was two, three pages. So I think that's been my struggle. That said, I've, it's type text, I've taken it out, I'll put it in later in future books. Because I think it's, it's just a question of spreading it out as opposed to giving people big info dumps, you know. Here's 10 pages where I will educate you about the history of Bangalore. It, it has to be lighter through that. And the editorial process was very good because the UK editors, actually, they didn't tell me cut this. They just said, it's, it's slowing down the pace. And they left it to me to take the calls. But I realized it was slowing down the pace. So it was actually very, very useful in terms of, I felt I grew as a writer a lot. So you'd mentioned some. Yeah, uh, thank you for that uh, discussion. It was really interesting. And I wanted to uh, specifically ask you about um, your research. So you've me you'd mentioned some part of your primary research was speaking to uh, families, and that's essentially based on memories and recollections. Um, was there any uh, element of um, what was the secondary research involved and how did you access those documents? Uh, how challenging was that process? 
so yeah, the secondary research was extraordinarily challenging and that's all i already had that because i've already worked on the history of bangalore for my my academic research so but i have maps maps came from multiple places like the indian institute of world culture the mythic society uh, and some maps are online from the british library so the british library archives then there's a the gazettes and ledgers which are you know the documentary pr proceedings of various accounts and that came from the karnataka state archives in bangalore which is not easy to get into and it took us several months to no, of effort but again this is research we've been doing over a long time so i've had many people sit there and actually document these and you know so so that helps a lot then there were the photographs which a lot of them are online from the british library archives and the newspaper accounts british library is now digitized these archives you have to pay for access but if you pay for access there's a lot of material there and uh, there are again from the british library there are uh, british accounts which are in often in diaries and things like that which one can get so a mix of all of this material i, I mean volumes really of material the, the challenge is always of figuring out what to pick and what not to So the way mine worked, and I've learned about this entire publishing process. So Hatch, um, Little Brown took world rights, okay, and then uh, Hatchet is an arm of Little Brown. They're all part of the same conglomerate. So Hatchet publishes in India most of the Little Brown books. So that was taken care of. But uh, Little Brown UK sold audio rights to Isis Audio, which did the UK version. Then they sold the U.S. rights to Pegasus Books, which did the U.S. version. Then Pegasus Books sold the audio rights of the U.S. to Blackstone, which did the audio version. And apparently, there are many other sub rights that so far have not gone, but are in the pipeline. May or may not happen. That I'm now hearing are even possibilities. So that's how it went. Yeah. But for this part is very seamless because it's Hatchet is and Little Brown are part of the same larger organization. Uh, can I add a little bit about the research bit? um actually we really um it's really good now that we have access to a lot of the newspapers fr uh, that were published from the 1860s onwards 1870s onwards so um you can read um there's the madras courier there's the madras weekly i think there's the daily post and uh, there's the times of india which in those days was not the tabloid it is now so um very interesting accounts you know so there are and you also get to see how newspaper articles in those days were much meatier they were much longer so many different viewpoints so many quotes it's i mean it builds a picture just reading one article it's really fascinating like i could spend hours just reading them uh the mysore archives also has a section a selection of um, articles from the 1900s so like if you go the archives in mysore are much easier to access than the archives in bangalore uh sorry what no 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 i mean they do have a little bit uh, they do have a lot of the material digitized but then the newspapers you can actually take permission and go and uh, leaf through them it's quite fascinating yes at the they're all digitized by the way but you often get to see the pre the non digitized versions because they yeah. you're not authorized to see the digitized versions which is a different story but <laughs> Anything else? Writing process, book, little bits and pieces. Hello. Yeah, I just wanted to. I mean, you mentioned that um, you create character and you see where they go. I mean, uh, many writers write with the ending in mind. So, what do you think is the best process in writing? It's easier to write with the ending in mind. It's just I can't do it. So yeah, that has, didn't work for me. Uh, I'm sure it's much easier. So again, I've looked at writers talking about their own journeys, and they call them plotters and pantsers. So seat of the pants, that is the ones who write, uh, you know, without knowing the end, or plotters who have everything plotted out. And those who plot here actually are the kinds that do the three, four books a year because it's so e you know you f you spend time plotting and then you don't do these false ends back and forth. Maybe I'll get, there, but it doesn't work for me. It so it also makes a difference, you know. The ones which have the really surprising twists and secrets and little Easter eggs are the tightly plotted ones. The ones that are heavily character led are the ones where you just plunge in and the character takes you in. So it's always a trade-off. I think mine will be character led. Yeah. 
Um, I have a question. A lot of your book is obviously about history and heritage also comes into it because you're writing about the 1920s and culture and buildings and all that. How do you see the ways the city has become now and do you have any any thoughts on uh, preserving heritage or like is there is there some amount of heritage love that has come you know that has come into this which is coloring the way you've written it there obviously is a lot of heritage love i mean <laughs> writing about sheshadri puram more as i was telling you so meera had this lovely article on the polygonal buildings that um, were built in the divans various divans times and so i used a little bit of that in in book 2 and I then acknowledge her with a thank you for the article so there's a lot of those lovely buildings that we have but we have such few ones i mean you go to mysore it's just a treasure house right of 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 heritage and i have to say now you know though i keep saying i love bangalore i have this love for mysore that is now because it's like what bangalore used to be so i feel like some of the old bangalore survives there and maybe you know that's something that uh, i wish we preserved for instance i mean cash pharmacy was so close to us at bishop cottons we went there all the time and i just i look at the cash pharmacy building now i i feel very sad but So I wish we had a stronger way of preserving our heritage, but uh, no, we we clearly don't. So, any other questions? How many of you read mysteries generally? You do, yeah. Yeah, which is actually the the reason also that I wrote it because I feel like what I want to give people at the end is some bit of education in Bangalore, but really a good fun read. Yeah, and I feel like so this is a kind of slightly different uh, taking on a different topic. I feel like now the the taste in popular fiction is uh, and maybe it's an editor inspired or a filmmaker inspired thing. Look at look at Netflix for instance. They have lovely series, but they're also grim. so dark end of the world type brutality terror you know people being torn apart spectacle yeah but if you look at our mythology it's full of you know like heads being chopped off <laughs> and blood spurting and all like that's yeah, that's so weird that that is you know so like my grand nephew is for my grand Okay. Yeah. So, uh, no, they were watching three year olds, and you know, two guys hitting each other with banana plants that they pulled out of a plantation, whacking each other. Looks very brutal, but they're laughing, and they get that it's it's really written in a way that is not getting into that grimness. But these are written in a way. I mean, these are many of these are written in a very different way, where they're psychological. You get, the, you know, why is a serial killer a serial killer, or why is someone who goes and rips the skin of somebody doing that? And so I'm just curious, how many of you read gritty stuff, and how many of you read light stuff? So, if I'm sorry, this is just a completely my own writer's interest. But how many of you prefer the lighter side of things? Okay. And how many of you like the gritty stuff? It could be an overlap. You could put your hand up twice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is just good to know. I'm just just curious to know because for me, I can see the taste. broadly changing so much and i'm just curious about why whether it's whether it's the publishers and the editors and the filmmakers or it's public taste you know often it's it, because it's really what you get so uh, thank you harini no. thank you harini that was uh, i enjoyed that conversation uh, any if there are no other questions i think we'll call it an evening Thank you so much everyone I mean I really appreciate showing up on a weekday evening this late so